food sensitivities, sometimes when you have them, eating can feel a little bit like this. But when you get the recipe just right, it feels like this. Today, I'm going to be sharing my delicious go-to chocolate cake recipe. It's so good that it passes as a regular cake. As in, it does not taste like cardboard or chalk. Today's recipe will be dedicated to my gluten-free friends and those who bake for them. Hi friends, my name is Sherry Ray and this is Every Cake Tells a Story where we learn how to decorate together and love others through cake art because as I decorate, we'll get to know the individuals that cake is dedicated to. Today's cake is a little bit different though because we need to get to the heart of the cake, the recipe. So I'll be sharing that with you. In addition, it won't be dedicated to specific individuals, but to larger groups of people. First, those who are new to the gluten-free community. When my husband was first diagnosed with celiac disease, it took us a while to figure out what foods he could eat. He started out by just eating rice cake, meat and potatoes or rice, and vegetables. So I want to help encourage you, there are other options. Now, as a baker, I regularly see questions in cake forums I'm a part of, asking for gluten-free recipes or tips for baking gluten-free. I always get nervous when I receive food from a regular kitchen. I wonder, is there going to be cross-contamination? Do they know all the sources of gluten? Is it going to poison me? I wanted to share this recipe with you along with tips so that you can bake for your friends more safely. The biggest thing about baking gluten-free is, of course, the flour. When Scott was diagnosed, one of the first books I read was written by Jules Shepard called The First Year, Celiac Disease and Living Gluten-Free. I'll put a link to it in the description box below. Her book really helped me understand celiac disease and how to start baking and cooking gluten-free. In the book, she does have a recipe for a flour blend. And now, it's the only recipe I use. If something doesn't work with this flour blend, that recipe gets pitched. If it calls for a half cup sorghum flour, a quarter cup tapioca starch, half cup rice flour, I just total up all the flour and substitute this. One of the things I love about it is that if you have allergies or you've run out of a certain ingredient, she lists alternatives so you can switch it up. Jules is always researching gluten-free flour and blends and always updating her website. So I will include a link to her website along with her shop where you can buy her gluten-free flour blend already mixed and ready to use. All right, flour is done. Next step, read every single ingredient on every single item. Just kidding, eggs are always gluten-free. <laughs> I found with gluten-free baking, I have to go back to that old school method of mixing the dry ingredients separate from the wet. Some of the gluten-free flours and the xanthan gum, it's kind of like cornstarch in a hot liquid. It just clumps together and it doesn't like to be friends. So we're gonna start by mixing these dry ingredients. And while I do that, let me share some thoughts on oats. Oats are gluten-free, however, they are usually processed in the same facilities and with the same equipment as wheat and barley. So if you've ever been in an empty granary or a grain bin, you know that there's always some leftover product from the previous harvest. We only use purity protocol oats. That means that they never share the same equipment they're fully processed in a separate facility, so they're not getting cross-contaminated. In addition, they're not trying to separate it after the fact. It's always separate. We've been at different potlucks where people have tried to bring food knowing that we're coming, and it'll be a food with oats in it, and I so appreciate the effort, and I always feel bad when I have to say we're not able to eat it. So, purity protocol. Those are the oats for gluten-free. Okay, I've added a half cup butter and we're gonna cream the butter and the sugar together. While it's doing that, let me just share 
One of the reasons that I get nervous eating from a regular kitchen is the thought of cross-contamination. I know whenever I'm baking, I use the same measuring cups for everything. And so I'm cross-contaminating and I always worry, is that how someone else bakes? If the butter that you use was already used for buttering your toast, there's gonna be crumbs in here as well. One crumb from a piece of toast can make someone with celiac disease sick. You really wanna be careful with that cross-contamination. I'm editing right now, but I realized I missed something that I personally think is really important. If you're baking for your friends or family who are gluten-free for medical reasons, but you typically bake with regular wheat flour, I highly recommend mixing that batter by hand or investing in a cheap hand-held mixer that's only used for gluten-free. I've seen bits of my previous project fall into my bowl because it was stuck in that mixing element, and those crumbs are serious business. The last detail I wanna share is that my recipe actually in the notes calls for some brown sugar and some white sugar. But I got tired of running out of brown sugar in the middle of a recipe or having to microwave out those hard lumps. So now I just use all white sugar and for every cup of white sugar, I add a tablespoon of molasses. I just make it myself and I never run out of molasses. The recipe calls for three quarter cup brown sugar. So I'm gonna do two teaspoons. Once that's in, I'll add the eggs one at a time. Once that's in, I'll give my bowl a scraping. Okay, we've talked about old school baking and the old school is gonna continue here because we have our dry ingredients, but we have one more wet ingredient. So we're gonna add these by alternating. We'll go dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. So we'll start and end with dry. So I'll only add about a quarter of this. No, that's a third. Gluten-free flour is more poofy than regular flour. So you definitely want to start on a low speed to start with. I have ended up with flour all over my kitchen on more than one occasion. Everyone with celiac disease has very, very different symptoms. And I want to make sure that you know you can click on the eye above to see another video I made highlighting different individuals with their celiac stories. In that video, I decorate a cake that tells everyone that it is gluten free. Make sure to watch that video if you haven't seen it yet. I'm going to finish this up and meet you back over there when we're ready to put it in the pan. Oops, I forgot. We have to add vanilla extract. So the recipe calls for about a tablespoon. I just eyeball it. All right, we know how to throw our batter into a cake pan, but I want to share a few tips that are going to help us in the long run with decorating. I've included the bake time for several different sizes of cake pans, but I like to use one cake pan for the whole batter. It's three inches deep, and I get away with this by using a baking strip. A baking strip is just fabric that you wrap around your cake pan, and you fully soak it first, and then attach it. This helps the edges to not bake too fast and get overbaked. When the edges bake, they firm up in place, so the only area left for the rising is in the center of the cake. So the baking strip helps the whole cake to rise together. The second item is parchment paper. I've got parchment paper on the bottom of my cake pan and I've already greased the sides. Now we can pop our batter in there. Final tip on this one, after many trials and error, I was discovering the center of my cake was not cooking all the way through. So now I use a flour nail. I just grease this up and put it in the center of the cake. That helps to bring extra heat right there to the center. Now it fully cooks all the way in. It helps the heat evenly distribute. And let's smooth it out just a little bit more. And there we go, we're ready to pop this guy into the oven. It's all done. You can see how the baking strip really helped it to rise evenly, and it doesn't have a huge dome of wasted cake. But is there really such a thing as wasted cake? 
When I start leveling, my kids come running. There's no wasted cake in this house. I'm gonna hold on to this cake for an upcoming video featuring a young lady who went through a difficult season, but music really helped her through it. Make sure to click subscribe below so you don't miss that video. And finally, this cake recipe has got to be dedicated to the gluten-free community out there, especially those just getting started with a gluten-free life and the gluten-free bakers. As always, if any of these stories rang true for someone you love, turn around and dedicate it to them because we're all about loving others here. Bye friends.